we think of the Earth floating alone in space as a single experiment in the evolution of life. But about a hundred million years ago, Pangaea split up and divided into half a dozen continents and islands that floated separately in splendid isolation. And for the landlocked creatures on these continents and islands, those that couldn't fly very far or swim, each of these continents and islands was a separate experiment in evolution. In 1963, Pierre Boulle wrote a book translated into English as Planet of the Apes. And then in 1968, it was turned into a movie starring Charlton Heston and a bunch of other apes. Now, in this movie, Charlton Heston, you can see, has a leash. These are the scientists, the chimpanzees. Then the orangutans are the judiciary, and the gorillas are the military, and they didn't talk about the uh, bonobos. Uh, but they treat him as a prisoner, like they treat the other homo sapiens. The other homo sapiens are mute. He can talk amazingly, and they speak English. And uh, at the end of the movie, we, Charlton Heston, walking along the beach with a mute nubile woman and a horse, come across this. And when they see this, they say, ah, oh no, it's the Statue of Liberty. What in the world have we done? This is Earth we're on. We're not on some faraway planet. Now, the ridiculousness of this has led me to propose the Planet of the Apes Law of Astrobiology. Here's the law. It says, if you crash land on an unknown planet that has horses and corn, mute homo sapiens, and three other species of great apes speaking English, you don't need the Statue of Liberty to know that you're on Earth. So, here's the crude version of the Planet of the Apes hypothesis. Here we are humans at the top of the pyramid. And here are apes, dogs, sheep, vertebrates with half a brain. And at the bottom are bacteria, worms, fungi, and stupid things. We are the best. Now this is the, what we call the intelligence niche towards which all or at least some species evolve. Now, that's what they would do. They would evolve. But suppose we have World War III, four, five, or six, and we just kill ourselves or margin, get marginalized somehow, then the apes or some species of apes will evolve into the intelligence niche. This is called the th stupid things get smarter model of animal evolution, or my adaptive strategy is better than your adaptive strategy. Now, human narcissism has a long tradition. Here's Narcissus falling in love with his reflection. She doesn't mind looking at herself either. Now, in the Cambridge Encyclopedia of Human Evolution, they wrote, not only do we find ourselves fascinating, but most of us assume the inevitability of our existence. Take the theme of the film Planet of the Apes. If something happens to humans to remove them from the evolutionary stage, then other apes will become human. Because that is what evolution is striving for. They're being sarcastic here. <laughs> now, here's the fancy version of the Planet of the Apes hypothesis. It says, there is a human-like intelligence niche. There is selection pressure on other species, including our ancestors, to occupy this niche. And in our absence, in a terrestrial setting, or on other planets, some species will evolve into that niche and develop technology. Carl Sagan has called the occupants of this, this niche the functional equivalent of humans. Now, I call it the human-like intelligence niche, not the intelligence niche, because generic intelligence is poorly defined. Each animal species, with or without a brain, seems to have its own version of intelligence. Um, and our human intelligence, unlike any other type of intelligence on Earth, has allowed us to build radio telescopes and given us the ability to hear and be heard across interstellar distances. This ability that we humans have and that we are able to look for in others is a species-specific characteristic, hence human-like intelligence. Species-specific means it's only in one species. That's why I call it human-like intelligence. So here's the question that we would like to know the answer to. 
Is human-like intelligence a convergent feature of evolution? Should we expect it elsewhere? Now, when you go around the world and ask people, you ask biologists, most of them will say, no, 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 no. If you ask physicists or Hollywood scriptwriters, they will say, yes, of course it is. We need to make movies. And physicists say, hey, of course it is. We're so smart. Physicists are so smart that everybody wants to be a physicist. Therefore, aliens want to be physicists too. Now, Frank Drake and his equation. Now, I was going to a meeting, and I just we were flying from Mexico City to Oaxaca, and I was sitting next to Frank. I'd never met him. I was just so happy to be sitting next to Frank, and I said, Frank, why do you think they're intelligent aliens who have built radio telescopes? What do you think is the strongest evidence for the idea that human-like intelligence is a convergent feature of evolution? He's a scientist. I knew these were specific questions that he had already thought about. And indeed, he had. And he looked over at me, and he says, read Harry Jerison. I'd never heard of Harry Jerison. So I read him. Here's the main plot the take home from Harry Jarrison, 1991. Here's millions of years ago. Here's today, 50 million years ago, 100 million years ago, 200 million years ago. So time is this way. Actually, it's going this way. On the y-axis is encephalization quotient, EQ, essentially how brainy you are, how big your brain is compared to your body. And here we are. We're the biggest ones up here. And you can see that, ooh, look at that. There seems to be some kind of trend. And I would maintain that this sketch is not evidence for a general trend toward increased EQ. Why not? Well, consider this argument. Suppose you're an elephant and you say, oh, I'm kind of, I'm big, but whales are bigger. What's my, I have tusk, but you know, my best feature, the thing that makes me different and stand out is the nasalization quotient, the length of my nose compared to the length of my body. So let's see how, let's make a plot. And when you make a plot, here we are, we're elephants here, and here's today, here's 200 million years ago, and you can see there is a trend towards a large NQ. Well, this sketch is not evidence for a trend towards increasing NQ because we have chosen the y-axis so that our species, or the species of interest, is by definition in the, in the upper right. That's cheating. Richard Dawkins says, elephant astronomers might wonder whether on some other world there exist alien life forms that have crossed the nasal Rubicon and taken the final leap to full probositude. <laughs> anyway, getting back to this sketch. If here's time today, 100 million years ago, 200 million years ago, and let's just invent a quotient, call it the X quotient. If you choose that X quotient and a species that's right here, species today with the highest XQ, then where do you think its ancestors will be? They'll be along here. Similarly, if you choose a species down here today with the lowest XQ of all existent species, then its ancestors will be here. And if you choose an average one, then its ancestors will be kind of average. So it really depends on what you're choosing here as the y-axis and who, which species you're choosing here. So how long did it take us to get such big brains? Well, here's today, one million years ago, two million, three million years ago. Here's cranial capacity in centimeters cubed. And you can see, how long did it take? Here we are. And it took about two or three million years to go from here to here. That's, this is two, this is three million years. Two or three million years to increase our cranial capacity from there to there by a factor of three or so. Now. Let's try to put this in context. Here's the Earth today with continents. 60 million years ago, here's what they were. They were floating around freely. Look at India, all by itself, at Madagascar, South America. And 120 million years ago, they were kind of concentrated here in Pangaea, and they started to break up at about 100 million years ago. The point is that half a dozen long-duration experiments in vertebrate evolution have already tested the Planet of the Apes hypothesis. So let's draw a little diagram, be a little bit more scientific. Here's time, 200 million years ago, 100 million years ago, today. Here is Pangaea, broke up into Gondwana and Laurasia. Gondwana broke up into Antarctica and Australia, Madagascar and India. Here's South America and, Aust and Africa. They broke up about 100 million years ago. So this is the kind of like a chart of that map I showed you. Now, 
two to three million years to get this giant brain. There it is, two to three million years on this time scale. So it's really small compared to the duration of the independence of these islands and continents. Now, what about New Zealand? Now, Jared Diamond said New Zealand is as close as we will get to the opportunity to study life on another planet. And I can recommend his, uh, him as an author. Here's some of the books he wrote. And here he is being congratulated by Clinton for why sex is fun, I think. In any case, there is New Zealand. What filled the intelligence niche there during its more than 100 million years of independent evolution? Was it a tuatara or was it a kiwi? Which of these is evolving towards or has evolved towards the human-like intelligence niche? I would say, hmm. How about in Australia, 100 million years of independent evolution? Which of the vertebrates evolved towards humanity? Well, koala, kangaroo? I don't think so. How about in Madagascar? Thousands of species of vertebrates and, you know, ring-tailed lemurs, are they evolving towards humanity? No. India bumped into Asia and it was kind of independent for about 80 million years. It didn't produce anything that was more like a human being. South America, for 100 million years, the New World monkeys, now, they do not seem to be evolving towards human-like intelligence. So if you put all these critters on their respective continents and islands, and compare them to this two or three million years, each of these continents with their millions of lineages has had 30 or 50 times longer to get smart than our lineage needed. So there have been some objections to this argument. One is we don't see other occupants of this intelligence niche on Earth because we are the first and we have suppressed or killed the others. Now the problem with that is Humans weren't even on these other continents and islands until 1,000 or 60,000 years ago. Remember, this, we're talking about millions and 50 million and 100 million. Therefore, we could not have suppressed them until very recently. Therefore, according to the Planet of the Apes hypothesis, we should see evidence for the evolution toward human-like intelligence. We don't. Someone does not have to be the first sulfur-crested cockatoo, or the first Indian elephant, or the first human-like intelligence. Species are not inevitable. By saying someone has got to be the first, you are assuming what we are trying to test. It doesn't work that way. That's not science. Here's another objection. These experiments don't tell us that human-like intelligence is rare. It tells us that one out of six experiments produces human-like intelligence. That's not rare. Well, there's a little bit of a subtle argument, but what's wrong with that? Well, consider a lottery. Let's suppose that there are a million ping-pong balls with numbers. And let's suppose that I pick six balls. One of them is 254,978. I feel it is a special number better than the other five. Was the chance of picking that number one out of six? No. We know of life on one planet, but that does not mean that the probability of having a life on a planet is one out of one, a hundred percent. Our existence on Earth can tell us little about the probability of life in the universe, because even if this probability were infinitesimally small, and there were only one life-harboring planet in the universe, we would, of necessity, find ourselves on that planet. The same logic applies to human-like intelligence. In a parallel statement, our existence on Earth can tell us little about the probability of the evolution of human-like intelligence in the universe, because even if this probability were infinitesimally small, and there were only one planet with the kind of intelligence that can ask this question, we, the question askers, would, of necessity, find ourselves on that planet. So, to summarize, I think humans are unique, just like every other species on Earth. All species are unique. And it makes no sense to concoct an imaginary set of which we are the only terrestrial member, and then suppose that biological evolution elsewhere in the universe evolves 
toward this set. This concoction is the plan of the apes hypothesis. It is testable. Paleoneurology, that Harry Jerison, does not support it. Half a dozen multi-million year experiments in vertebrate evolution are the best data we have to test it. This suggests that there is no generic group of functionally equivalent humans in the universe. This can explain the great silence. Where is everybody? Why haven't they contacted us? Yet, I support SETI because when we have the technology to cheaply explore new parameter space, we should do it. I think null results are important. The universe may be stranger than we can imagine. And lastly, of course, <laughs> I may be wrong <laughs> about the planet <coughs> of the apes. If the planet of the apes hypothesis were correct, then on each of these islands and continents, after 50 or 100 million years of evolution, we should expect some type of human-like intelligence to have evolved. We should expect functionally equivalent humans to have evolved. 60,000 years ago, when we arrived in Australia, we should expect kangaroos with, with smartphones. And 20,000 years ago, when we arrived in the New World, we should expect monkeys with, with guns. Such was not the case.